Hello, everyone. Uh, like I said, my name is Adrian Taka. I'm a software engineer from Las Vegas. And this is my first international talk, so thank you so much for being a part of it. Uh, just a little bit about me. I wrote a book. It's called Coding for Kids Python, something I'm very proud of, something I see in the hands of little kids, and I get very excited about it. Uh, I'm also a LinkedIn Learning instructor, and right now I focus on Azure and cloud development courses. So without further ado, who here has performed a code review? Raise your hand. OK, that's a very good amount. I'm glad to see that. Now, when we perform code reviews, you ever think about why we do them? Why do we do code reviews? And when you think about the why, the why in doing this critical process, what you find is that those whys are actually our ideal code review goals. And I'll talk about some of them today. For my team, the first goal that we do code reviews for is to catch design flaws. Essentially, does this code make sense? Are the files that the proposed changes are in making sense? Do they belong in this code base? Do they belong in a different library? Major design flaws are something we try to catch in code reviews. Second goal, ensure code clarity and coherence. So these are things like, is it too complex? Can I understand the code? If it's taking me too long to understand it and reading it in the code review, there's chances that there's bugs hiding in that complexity, and there's a greater chance that it's going to be harder to refactor later on. Validate necessity. You have mentioned this earlier, where one of the questions you ask is, do we even need this feature? So this is something that we want to try to look for in a code review. Is this the right time for this feature? Is something about to be deprecated that makes this useless? These are the types of things that we want to look for in code reviews. And last but not least, you want to confirm the functionality. Does it do what it's supposed to do? Does it do what the developer intended for it to do? And especially for UI changes, and especially if you don't have that automated, you want to do your due diligence to make sure the change that is occurring is actually what it's supposed to be. So when you keep these code review goals in mind, I want to ask you again, who loves doing a code review? OK. And just like the room, just like my slides, not too many people love it. A lot of people that I talk to, my own experience, no one is jumping up to say, our process is perfect, and I love doing code reviews. Why? I will tell you why. The top three code review complaints I have heard and what we can do about them. First one is subjectivity. Second one is tone of voice. And third one is process loopholes. And I'll start with subjectivity. What's subjective? You've seen examples of these kinds of comments before. And these are the ones that are probably the most annoying to get on a code review. These are things like, this is from a materialized repo, indentation. What about this one, from a hands-on table repo? The things I've outlined, and I apologize if it's hard to see, but the parts in yellow are essentially the developer or the reviewer saying, I would have loved this extra functionality. It would have been nice if you went above and beyond what you actually delivered. This is not the right forum to place here. The dev that was implementing this function actually did what he said to do. And he implemented what was vetted already. So this is a form of premature optimization, wanting something that is preferential. And there are other examples of this, like you should really indent lines 23 and 27, or replace var with const. Come on, it's 2019. Or I'd rather use regexes here. And the best one, total number of users is a better name. Ugh. No, <laughs> these are things that should not go in a code review. These are the things that cause ongoing debates. They cause tension among developers. This is what makes us dread doing code reviews in the first place. So what can we do better? To start, before you take any of the considerations and tactics that I propose to you, the very first thing you should do is to gain consensus with your team. You need to have this conversation because you need to all be on the same page. 
need to be on the same page about styling, about naming conventions, about code review policies, all of these things and everything afterward will be much easier if you're all on the same page. So out of this meeting that you have, there's something called a team working agreement. And I've done this in every team that I've been on, and it's a great, great document. This is a living, breathing document that basically has everything I just said. What is your style guide? What is the thing that you, uh, what are your naming conventions? What are your code review policies? What is the code review process? Not only is this a valuable resource for new developers, so they can try to follow your process, but it's something that you can refer back to um, anytime you need to uh, if, if a debate is ongoing. Let the robots take over. And what I mean by this is, if you saw Jews talk earlier, we saw that there was very, very nice error handling. It actually told you the error that was happening. And what I've found is that developers usually take it much easier if a computer tells them what's wrong, rather than a human. So if my, my terminal tells me I have a syntax error, I'm OK with that. But if someone tells me to, the, to my face that I have a syntax error, I'm probably going to be really annoyed with them. And plus, they're better at it anyway. So with that said, there are tools like Prettier and ESLint. These have saved team relationships. I know they have saved mine in, in the beginning. Prettier you can use if you have no idea where to start for a style guide. And these things are going to eliminate any of the debates that you have about styling, about formatting, about replacing var with const. But again, as, soon, as long as you have consensus with your team, all of these tools are there to help you enforce it, so you never ever have to think about this again. So you can focus on the things that matter. And lastly, objectivity always wins. What's objective? This change should probably go into our utils library. It will be reused quite a bit. I've run this on several browsers, and this toast actually pops up on the top right. But our ticket specifies bottom right. Can we fix it so it matches our re requirements? Or I'm having trouble keeping up with the logic on lines 457 to 464. Is there a way we can simplify it or make it clearer? And this method is being deprecated in two weeks. I suggest replacing it with the authenticate user method from our authentication library. All of these comments are fair game. And if you notice, they all align back to a code review goal. It's not subjective. It's not coming from preference. It's talking about the code and never about the developer. And they're more likely to make you go, sure, I'll do that. So that's subjectivity. The next complaint that I always hear about is tone of voice. Comments can be super, super mean online. There's no context to them. You don't get to see the mannerisms of the person. You don't see their facial expressions. You don't see anything but what they have written. This is a, you know, I, I was surprised because I was trying to find an example and I was hoping not to find one, but it was actually pretty easy to find one. Uh, this is from a materialized repo. And this person s says pretty much, this looks like shit. You never want to say that in a code review, especially in an open source project. This could be someone's first time contributing. They're probably never going to contribute again if you have a comment like this. It's not constructive. It doesn't refer back to anything. It's not a good comment. Other examples. This implementation is terrible. And the worst is when they just say that and don't at least explain why it's terrible. What part is terrible? Not a good comment. Didn't we decide not to do this at our last meeting? Again, this is something that reeks of you calling out that developer, saying, you, you did not listen to this. Or why would you use this when there's obviously no benefit? Again, now you're actually directly calling out the dev. You're saying, you're pretty much saying you're an idiot. <laughs> why are you doing this? Or are you really using Lodash? Really? Really? These types of comments, you see the highlighted ones there? These are essentially digital tomatoes that you are throwing in the face of those developers. These are things that may affect developers. Junior developers will probably really take it to heart. Senior developers or anyone else, really, nobody wants to hear this. So what can we do better? TLDR, do not be a jerk. 
But if there are guidelines that I ask you to follow, if there's anything I ask you to take away from my talk today, it would be the following guidelines that I ask myself every time I do a code review. Oops. Suggest, but with facts. If there's another reason or another implementation that you think is better, say so, but explain your reasoning. It's always better to tell them why you're making that suggestion in the first place. It's always better to have context as to why you're making that suggestion. Because if you just suggest it, it just sounds like, oh, my boy is better than yours, so do it. Reject, but with courtesy. Think about how you would want to receive the comments that you were about to write for that dev. What would you want? The courtesy part here is, you know, you're not, I'm not asking you to deny that the code is bad or that it could have been implemented um, in a better way, but there's always a better, nicer way to say it. And if you remember the team working agreement, let's say that somebody actually violated that and you say you're not approving it because it doesn't follow those rules. Well, it's always easier to say, hey, I'm not following the teamwork agreement that our entire team has agreed upon. It's much easier to accept that rejection uh, versus just you telling them no. And clarify, but with an open mind. This is when you actually have some questions about what they're doing. And with the open mind part is saying, you're asking them why they implemented it in this way not because you're going to change their mind, not because you want to tell them that your way is better, but because you truly want to have an understanding of why they implemented it. Keep in mind, they have been working in this code base probably a little bit longer than you. They've been in the weeds a little bit longer than you. They might have some insight that you don't know about the code that you may not be thinking of. Keep, it, keep that open mind and make sure to discuss that with the developer if there is something you want clarified. Lastly, process loopholes. So although not, not necessarily in the code review itself, but it's something that I hear very often when I talk about code reviews. And what I mean by that is, number one, bias. Have you ever had those teammates who kind of just approve each other's pull requests? It's like, hey, you're my buddy, I approve yours, you approve mine, cool. Not cool. Second thing, no reviews at all. That's really bad. <laughs> but that's a complaint that I've heard from smaller companies, startups, or places that just focus on pushing out, shipping, and don't go through a code review process at all. And the last thing I call MVE, minimum viable effort. You know these people, you put up this nice pull request, it's nicely documented, you, you put the ticket that it uh, corresponds to, you have a nice description of what you're doing, and like 10 seconds later, looks good to me, approve. You didn't look at that code review. You didn't do the due diligence of making sure you are trying to achieve those code review goals that we talked about in the beginning. So these are the things that are really annoying. So what can we do better? Number one, in your teamwork agreement, establish code review policies. Things that have worked for my team, if there's a really, really long pull request, usually we try not to do if, you know, there's a certain number. If it's like 50 files changed, we say no, we're not doing that. But if it's n impossible to do that, then we have all had an agreement where we say, anybody at any time, if the code review is too long, we can say, I declare a code review. Everyone stops what they're doing, that person gets to put their code on the screen and talks about it with the whole team because it's just too much to cover for one person. Another really good part of code review policies, auto add developers to PRs. So to tackle bias, make sure you add your entire team or make sure that you have at least two people approving for a pull request, not just one. Or make sure you have everybody approve. Another really cool feature is something called code owners in GitHub. And this file here is an example of that. It works similarly to a git ignore file. Basically, what this does is you can assign people to particular parts of your code base, which is really nice. So if you know somebody has been working on, let's say, just the front end, or someone has been working in a legacy code base, 
you can tag that person and you can assign them to that. And every time a pull request is opened, they will be auto added to that. So you know that the devs who probably have a better understanding of that code can do a thorough code review on that. And lastly, enforce the process for everyone. This includes managers. I've worked on teams where managers have access to the, um, the repos, and it's really scary. <laughs> so just because they're a manager, and just because they know a little bit of code, they don't have any review process. No, any code that goes through, doesn't matter who wrote it, everyone goes through the same process. This goes for the Rockstar developers as well. You almost kind of assume that because they're so good and they're so perfect that you don't need to check it. No, check every line of code. Everyone deserves a full due diligence, fair review in their code because not everyone writes perfect code. And because even after the PRs are merged, you still have to work with your teammates. So if you follow all of these rules, I can assure you, you will be much happier with your team and you'll still like each other afterwards. <laughs> Thanks. And if you want to give feedback on my talk, that is the QR code for the joined in uh, talk. I would love your feedback, good or bad. Make sure to suggest with facts, reject with courtesy, and clarify with an open mind, please. Thanks. Thank you, Adrian, for this great talk. We have a couple of minutes left, so if anyone has any questions, sure. Thanks a lot for this talk, it's amazing. Um, I have two questions, um, both very related, like what are the process for writing the working agreement? Because I have been through a lot of teams and we try to do that and we start super excited and then you know you just ignore it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think like this is this is one. Um, the other one is, is about also you mentioned like trying to m mention all your team members, but what is the rule of thumb? I mean, after how many approvals do you, do you consider it ready to go or because that's always confusing. Um, so for the second question, uh, if I understood correctly, how many iterations does it take before you come to a consensus? No, so if you always mention, like uh, my team is f six people, so if you always mention the five, you have to always wait for the five approvals, mm -hmm. um, and that makes things a bit slower. So right. we kind of, I, I usually mention everyone, but then after third approval or something, I move on, and then some people in my team really disagree with this concept. And yes. Okay, yes, so I have had the luxury of working on small teams where this works. There's only a max of maybe five, six people at a time. But the great thing about the team working agreement is that it's not set in stone. So as you go through your processes, you see what works for your team. If you have a very large team, if you have a distributed team, maybe you have different team working agreements for co-located teams or those who are working on the same project. Those are the types of boundaries that can help because yes, it's impossible. If you have 300 developers and you're waiting for all of them to approve it, that's not gonna happen. So the team working agreement is a great way to find that balance. Again, it's not set in stone. You iterate through it, you see what works for your team, and then you change it. The most important thing is that you gain consensus with everybody that matters, and then you change that team working agreement and then you enforce it. I just have one quick question. So regarding all of those uh, you said for uh, code reviews, for example, if we are reviewing some project as whole, all those uh, tips can be applied there as well, or there may be some potentially additional tips for, uh, for example, project reviews. Um, are you asking how to implement that if you work by yourself and not on a team? Um, I mean a team project, for example. Some uh, like team projects or something like that. I'm not sure I understand your question. Sorry. Can you uh, say one more time? Can I explain after the presentation? Because uh, I will explain after the presentation. I will okay, okay. You. That's fine. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Good. Uh, one more round of applause for Adrian. Thank you very much.